today is October 17th, 2014. We are here today with Merlin Little Thunder. My name is Mary Larson and we're here at the OSU Library to talk about Merlin's work bringing in the Sand Creek Pipe. So Merlin, thanks for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, where this painting's going for the next little while? This painting is going to be an exhibit at the Denver Art Museum for the 150th anniversary of the Sand Creek Massacre. So that'll be November 29th? November 2nd. 2nd, okay. Mm -hmm. all right. um, who all, you mentioned when we were talking earlier that you're going to have a number of other folks who are going to be there lecturing on Sand Creek along with you. Could you talk a little bit about some of the programming they have set up for that? Well, they selected five tribal members, their images and their 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 uh, version of the Sand Creek Massacre, which was one of them was Brent Learnett and uh, uh, George Levi, me, Nathan Hart, and I'm not sure who the other one was. Mm -hmm. They were kind of in a hurry, they kind of done it, done it very, really quickly, but, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was, a, it was an important, important to get the right people involved, get all the people, all the components, you know, that was uh, important for this, uh, for this event. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of, I, I guess this exhibit is meant as a way to address some of the problems in an earlier exhibit that got closed down because of some questions about accuracy? Oh yeah, the um, tribes were not consulted about the material that went into the, this, other, this other exhibit in, in, in April and they closed it down because they were not satisfied with the, with the material. The material had a lot of discrepancies, the dates were wrong and the people and the names, etc. Mm -hmm. And that was, was the previous exhibit at the Denver Art Museum? Yes. Okay. Well, since we're here today to talk a little bit about the painting, um, can you start by telling me what it was you had in mind when you when you started working on this? Well, I, um, the original thought was uh, was that. Uh, wasn't really about this upcoming, upcoming uh, anniversary. It was just a reading, reading history. Every time I get ready to do shows, you know, I'm always uh, reading history books and and trying to trying to portray important events that occurred in our tribe and our history. So you know, I was reading about the, the Sand Creek Massacre, and I was reading about. I wanted to know more about the events after afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, rather than the actual event that occurred. I wanted to know what happened afterwards, because that's where we come in. We come in afterwards. We don't we don't come in before or during. We come in afterwards. So it's kind of like you we, you want to find out where you fit in, because Sand Creek was like a was like a jewel, a multifaceted jewel. And when that occurred. That event occurred, then these multifaceted Jews were were uh, scattered all over everywhere. And each one of us, tribal members, Shining the Rappel members, are, are we have a part part of that facet, where that jewel part of that little facet. And we want to know where we fit in. Me myself, my family uh, are Bent's descendants. We're descended from William Bent. Through, uh, I think a lot of us are descendant from him through Owl Woman, often referred to as Yellow Owl. We came from, from, from that descendancy and through uh, our descendancy came from George Bent. That's where we came from, his, his, uh, one of his uh, sons, George. I think there were, uh, there were George and Charlie and Robert, Mary and Lucy, I think he had five children. So that's where we came from, we came from George Bent so you know, knowing this information going forward, I started doing research about the Bent's descendants and Bent's Fort, and all the events surrounding it, and that led up to Sand Creek. Mm -hmm. So then I continued forward to research more about Sand Creek Massacre, and then 
I read and I read all the horrific events that occurred during the massacre, and you know that that um, made me want to go forward and find out what happened afterwards, and you know where we fit in. Mm -hmm. So you know this um, this this painting here speaks about a time afterwards where um, um, where the survivors uh, went to the Smoky Hills, where the dog soldiers were camped. They went to the Smoky Hills, and then they. Um, they all uh, regrouped, and after everybody found out what happened, because there were mostly women and children at Sand Creek, there was hardly no warriors there. They were all out hunting, because mm -hmm. there was a big camp, and they had to feed all those people, you know, so they went out hunting. Now, these uh, people at Sand Creek consisted of bands. They're called bands. Bands are families. Societies are, and clans are warrior societies or groups. Now, within these bands, there were societies, and there were a lot of them. There were a lot, a lot of bands, and a lot of people who were important to the Cheyenne people in history were lost. And um, so after they regrouped at the Smoky Hills, uh, they uh, sought revenge because the soldiers were coming to them and coming forward, and they were offering peace. But all the while, behind their back, they were saying, kill Cheyennes wherever, whenever, and wherever found. So they were, this dog soldiers were angry about that because um, Black Kittle had signed a treaty at Fort, Fort Wise that didn't, didn't include all of us. The dog soldiers were angry about it because the, they were not consulted and they were not present. And he signed for them. He said, they told him, he don't speak for us. He don't speak for us. So uh, that's why they were at the Smoky Hills and not at Sand Creek. They, they caused a division. So when the, they found out at, at uh, the Smoky Hills, they uh, gathered together a big council, and they they sought to sought to take revenge from for Sand Creek. So they sent out pipes to all their allies, and these pipes were to be smoked with the allies. To, to uh, there were war pipes to go to war, and these pipes were very important. Were sacred pipes, and uh, this 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 image portrays one of the pipes going to the Northern Cheyenne and. Over there in Montana, they went to the, they sent a pipe to the Northern Cheyennes to smoke with them, and they treated this pipe like a like a person. This pipe had its own horse, it had its own implements. It was a very sacred and very important pipe. Now he's uh, he's hailing he's hailing this uh, Northern Cheyenne, he's hailing him, and uh, Northern Cheyenne. Uh, Warrior here already knows what it is. He already sees the horse, and he already knows that there's a pipe on that on that horse. But he's making a motion. He's making the motion. It's a pipe, which is which is like this. Which you run your hand up like this, and then you whirl it up like smoke. See, as he has this, he's whirling the hand up like this. Could you do that again? Okay. Yeah, he's he he motions he he motions like this. And then he hurls, hurls his hand up like that. It's a pipe. So this man is shifting his hand like this. It means good, good, good. When they say that, good, it means come on, come on, that's good, come on, let's go. So they're going to all smoke with the Northern Cheyennes. They sent another pipe to the, um, to the Northern Rappos. And then they sent another pipe to the Sioux. They sent these pipes out to smoke with these, with these, uh, with these men. Now what occurred later on was a lot of uh, raiding, a lot of uh, fighting on, along the uh, Republican River, along the um, Platte River, along those trade routes. A lot, of, a lot of that had occurred and happened. And a very important event took place there, an event that impacted everybody, all the tribes. And what happened was that these, uh, these, these we call them dogmen, but society calls them dog soldiers, but we call, they were called dogmen. These dogmen raided and they, uh, they took revenge on a lot of these uh, uh, soldiers and a lot of these, uh, these uh, people who were bringing freight wagons in with supplies. They, they took those supplies and they took those, um, took those uh, ledger books from the, from the freight, freight uh, freighters, mm -hmm. from military freighters and the, and the commercial freighters, and they drew their exploits in those, in those books, what they call ledger books. Ledger art, that's where it first came from. The dog soldiers did that. 
They recorded everything in, in very, very detail, accurate detail. They recorded all of the, the uniforms the, the soldiers wore, the hats, the weapons, the horses, their tack on their horses. They recorded everything with amazing detail and their exploits with amazing detail also. So all the while that, that this is happening, other tribes catch on to this to this ledger ledger uh, ideal and they uh, they begin to do it but they don't never attribute it to the Cheyenne dog soldiers who first did it who first brought it in prior to this nobody ever done it on ledger books nobody ever painted on ledger books drew on ledger books these are the first people to ever do that and you know that's what I would like to see I would like to see people all these ledger artists attribute it to to its uh, origins to these Cheyenne dog soldiers that's what I would like to see. And this painting is going to have a big impact on the on the um, on the show because a lot of the artists there are only going to bring ledgers. They're going to be ledger, some ledger drawings, and some are going to have. We're going to all have our own faucet, our own facet. We're going to put together a facet over there, so where that you know that stone is going to be whole again, mm -hmm. you know. So that's what that's that's my uh, that's my ideal of the show anyway. You mentioned a little bit about the detail in the ledger books. One of the things that's always so apparent in all of your paintings is the detail. You have such fine detail. Does that, is that influenced by the detail that you remember that you've talked about in the ledger books or, or is it just, that's just your particular style? I think the detail came from uh, growing up by the river. We grew up by the river and we were always in the North Canadian River. Summer, fall, winter, spring, we were always in that river and they couldn't keep us away from that river. So we were always able to watch watch the uh, the river change, watch her leaves change to go and green again. We were always able to watch everything, watch, watch the animals come out. We noticed all the animals that came and went. Different seasons, different animals were there and they were gone. So, you know, it was a lot of detail. It was a lot and lots of detail, a lot of things to watch. So I think growing up along that river gave me an eye for detail. So, you know, I pay attention to today. I pay attention to the seasons when they change. I know all the birds and animals that come and go within these seasons, you know. So it goes back to then. Mm -hmm. When you're starting a painting like this, um, do you start with, well, where, where do you start? I mean, you, you, have this, you, you have the history that you know, but do you start by thinking of one particular person or one particular item in the painting, like the pipe? Or do you start from thinking of the whole scene? How, how do you put that all together? Well, you know, today, um... The Cheyenne people are one of the few remaining people who continue to uh, practice their main ceremony. So we participate in those ceremonies. We go there and we participate. And then throughout that whole ordeal, we're, we're over there on the land for two weeks camping with, you know, like we don't have no watches. Time stands still and uh, events occur, things happen out there. And we go back by the river again. We're back along the river again. And then people are talking. People are disturbed and they're, they're, they're uh, talking about current, uh, current events, things that happen. And then these things that are happening today mirror things that happened in the past. They mirror one another. So uh, we, get to, we get to thinking about that and we, uh, it has an impact on our lives. So, you know, when I wake up in the morning, a lot of times, you know, I think I have those thoughts in my, in my head. And you sit down and you look at a blank space and you're thinking, huh, well, okay, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that event here today. So, you know, there was a time when uh, it rained real, real hard at our ceremonies and we made the fire. Everything was all set up, the lodge was set up we make the fire. Now, once you make that fire in that ceremonial lodge, you're not supposed to go out. So that next morning, it rained real hard. 
and it, it was raining on the fire. So we had to go over there and we had to shield it like this to shield the fire and it was raining, it was torrential. We we're trying to keep the fire from going out and mm -hmm. we were we we're using our body to keep it, keep it. And there was some light ear splitting lightning <laughs> coming around. It's all over. We were in the middle of these these lodge posts, you know, there were, you know, some of them are some of them are up there, you know, 16, 18 feet high, 26 feet high. You know, we're like in this lightning rod, you know, and this lightning and was coming down all over us and it was frightening. It was really scary to sit there and protect that fire, knowing that you could get hit by lightning any time, you know. So it was really a scary event. So event, things like that come back into play. So, you know, I remember those things and, you know, they'll appear on this, on this blank space. Things like that, you know, that are very, um, that are very traumatic or they're very uh, exciting. Things that come back like that, you know, remember those those events. So, you know, I got a lot of material to, to uh, a lot of material to uh, cover. It's a lot of things that our elders uh, spoke of and a lot of, a lot of the ways that we saw disappear, things that are, are not taking place today, language that's not being used today. Things like that, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we, we came from a family of uh, uh, horse traders. We come from a family of horse traders, and uh, whenever it came to mules or donkeys, you know, we, we hardly never traded, traded, traded for mules or donkeys. You know, we traded mostly for horses. And we asked the grandma and grandpa, how come we don't trade for, how come we don't trade for mules or horses? And they said, well, we don't call them up to mules very, very well, you know. So people don't talk like that anymore, you know. What they mean, what that term means is that we don't snuggle up to them, you know. Cotton up to them, snuggle up to them, you know. We don't, we don't do mules. But you know, what it was is that mules and, and uh, donkeys are a lot smarter than horses. But you know, we were just basically horse people. And you know, we, we, lived, uh, we lived with horses and among horses and we rode horses all our life. We were always around horses. So, you know, there's a lot of history that's coming back into play right now, going back and forth. So, you know, we kind of kind of attach on to that and put it down on the blank space, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember reading at Sand Creek that either George Bent or one of his family members was one of the only survivors from the camp. Is that something that you've heard? No, there were family? a number of survivors. There were a number of survivors, they all. They all um, were able to get away, but George was one of them. George and uh, George and uh, uh, Edmund Garrier, they were among the survivors. George had a, um, I think he had a, a wound in his hip. He had caught a ball in his hip, and uh, he was dragging along, dragging himself along. And then when uh, when uh, um, when they were going back to Vince Fort, they were trying to make their way back to Vince Fort, and George couldn't hardly, he could hardly even, because his uh, hip didn't mend very well, and he could hardly make it on the trail, and Edmund Garrier was with him. They were going back to Vince Fort, and uh, soldiers came and they uh, captured Edmund Garrier. So uh, George uh, slipped away. He was able to make it back to Vince Fort. When he got there, his father had, uh, had the appropriate uh, people to help him mend his hip. So he, he made it back to Bent's Fort. But um, one of the, um, I think it was um, um, Jack Smith. I, think, I believe his name was Jack Smith. Uh, uh, he was uh, able to save uh, George Bent because the um, soldiers already had a pistol at his head. He was trying to explain to him, this is William Bent's son. You can't kill this man. This is William Bent's son. So he was able to get it to the soldiers that this is William Bent's son. So they spared him. And they, they shot Jack Smith. So it was really a strange ordeal how that happened, how that had occurred. Mm -hmm. With the story that you've covered in this painting, um, is this an actual place here that you've been to? Or... I mean, is this a place that you've seen, or is this 
something you, that you've painted from knowing the landscape? Well, these people had their trail, their uh, roots, mm -hmm. their roots where they where they travel. They have their own highway system and uh, travel areas, and this is one of the areas where they traveled. And the reason why they traveled this way is because of this big rock here. There's a lot of legends about this big rock over there, about about how uh, how our brother and sister had uh, had been saved by uh, uh, by an animal. I think it was a bear. I think a bear saved them. I think a bear saved them over here on this rock. There's a lot of a lot of different. Um, versions of this story. We were told this story a long time ago when we was real young and we I don't hardly remember it. A lot of the stories that we were told remain fresh because they continued to tell us those stories as we aged, got got older and older and older. And other stories went by the wayside because they were not deemed to be important to us when we got older. Mm -hmm. The stories that we were told by to us by our elders were learning tools that taught us diff different things. So this story of this rock right here had passed its passed its face and we're on to other stories. And these other stories that were told to us were more important and they were stronger and they were for us to learn how to survive in this society right here. So we grasped those stories and we forgot these stories. We forgot these stories, but this is a story, it's an actual true place where this where this uh, this event happened? Does the rock have a name in Cheyenne? Or? I don't know its name. Okay. I don't know its name. It's Sometimes in story in the stories you hear the name. Uh -huh. We so. we forgot. Mm -hmm. We forgot because they stopped talking Cheyenne to us. Mm -hmm. When we went to school, they quit. They just quit, and we went back to. Um, the descendant of, uh, of a white antelope, his name was Joe Antelope, and we told our father we want to continue talking to Cheyenne. He said, well, you have to go ask Joe Antelope. So Joe Antelope was, at the time, was our arrow keeper. He was our, our, our principal person. So they were having a meeting across the, across the creek, and he came, and uh, he said, my father said, Joe's over there now, go ask him. So we went over there with our father, and he said, Joe, these boys want to ask you something. And he asked, he asked us, yeah, what do you want? So we want to, we want to keep, continue learning Cheyenne. And he looked at us, and he said, no. He said, you won't need it anymore. And that's when they stopped talking to us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we can understand it. We can understand a lot of the words, and we, we can... Uh, we can uh, speak some words, but then when we start talking shy, it gets caught in our throat, and we can't form the proper words that need to be formed, you know. So we kind of forgot that, those words. I know we, we heard these men talking in the lodges. We were little boys. We used to sneak over there, and we used to listen. Now, they were talking about this Sand Creek, but they were not using the word Sand Creek. They had another word for it. So it was an old dialect. It's a very old dialect they used to talk about these things, and they uh, we never learned it. We never learned it because they quit talking Cheyenne to us, and that's, those are the reasons for those things. But then bits and pieces come back, and we put them down. We put them down because the bits and pieces that we know, we want to pass them to our children. We want to make sure they know those things. Are any of the people, did you have any people in mind when you painted the men in in the painting there are are those actual people these are society you... members mm -hmm. this one here see he has a crooked lance right here these are elk scrapers and this here right here this man he's a dog soldier if you notice when you look at dog soldiers they have a lot of crosses crosses all over he has a cross on his uh, on his hat there, and crosses. These uh, these other these other men here are different. Are different. Uh, the Northern Cheyennes are mostly uh, uh, mixed with a tribe called Suttai. Suttai, Northern Cheyennes are Suttai. And they have the same society, but different. 
They have the same language as, as us, but different. They're the same as us, but they're different. And it's really hard to grasp those, uh, those, those terms mm -hmm. because when, we, when we're in our, our main ceremony, over here on the south side, over here is the Cheyennes, on the north side are the Allies. Mm -hmm. And then we have trouble in there because Cheyennes, northern Cheyennes are Cheyennes, but then they have to dance on the ally side. Say, so, hey, wait a minute, they're Cheyennes. And they're, they are, but they're different. They're the same as us, but they're different. And that's, we like to keep them that way, but we, we still don't know what that means, you know. How can you be the same as somebody, but also be different, you know? So, you know, that's, that's the thing about these people here, is they're same as us, but they're different. They're Northern. They're Northern Cheyennes, and their societies are the same as us, but with the exception that they have a, they have a Red Shield, Red Shield Warriors. And they also have, we have the uh, we have the dogmen and the dog, dog soldiers, and they have the crazy dog on that side over here. They're the same but different. Not a lot of not a lot of northern Cheyennes were at Sand Creek. A lot of them, there were only a few of them there. But what the puzzling thing to me was that Black Kettle was northern Cheyenne. He was northern Cheyenne, but then he was he belonged to the uh, uh, the band called. Uh, it was called uh, Hivitanios, which means Southern Cheyenne. He belonged to that band. Now, what what the indicators point to is that his wife was Southern Cheyenne, and he was Northern Cheyenne. So he has to go wherever his wife's people are, and he has to dwell among his wife's people and be one of them. So that's what tells us that. And he was a peace chief. And another puzzle to that was that he was a dog soldier, and dog soldiers are military, and they're fighting men. Well, why was he a peace chief? See, those were puzzles. Those were puzzles that, that we don't understand. A lot of contradictions. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Are there things that you want to talk about in the painting, I mean, that we haven't talked about? So things you want to point out or anything you want to discuss or explain? Anything about the clothing or anything they're carrying on the horses or, or the landscape stories you've heard about the trail or the rock or Anything in there that you painted that you were trying trying to preserve from that story? You know, as you said, you know, the stories get lost and you try to put it down. Are, are there things that you were trying trying to make sure got in there? Well, I just wanted to distinguish the, the difference between the Northern Cheyenne and Southern Cheyenne. Mm -hmm. The Northern Cheyenne came from Montana and some of those real, real beautiful areas mm -hmm. where things are different over there. Things are different in Montana than, say, you know, Colorado. Mm -hmm. the landscape is different. Everything is really different. It's different, but you know, like Southern and Northern Cheyenne, it's different but the same. You know, it's different but the same. But they came in a, came from a beautiful area, the Northern Cheyennes, and they were able to maintain their their um, you know their um, environment. They were even today they're in Montana. Today they're in Montana. They're in that beautiful environment, and then the, the, uh, they're isolated. See, this is an isolated area. They're isolated, and uh, they, uh, they know their landscape. They know their landscape. They know the area like we knew the North Canadian River. They know it the same way in the same manner. You know, they know they know uh, everything about the land, and uh, these are visitors here. Mm -hmm. These are visitors, but they know the trails. They know where to go. They go back and forth because mm -hmm. they're intermarried and they're the same people. So they go back and forth, but they don't go back and forth just to go say hello. You know, mm -hmm. they go back and forth for very important reasons. Mm -hmm. Very important reasons. They, they have their own ceremonies over here. This northern people they have their own. And a lot of times whenever they're intermarried over here, then they invite invite us to go over there. So we, we'll go over there to the Northern Cheyenne. They all, 
this speaks about the camp circle, the circle where we all camp over here. On the northeast side over here is where these Northern Cheyennes camp. This caught, uh, this has caught the, um, um, it's called the Eater Band, or they would call them the uh, Omissi, which is Northern Cheyenne Omissi. And then down here, over here, a little further down this way, is called the Grasshoppers, which is Northern Cheyennes. I mean, Southern Cheyennes are Grasshoppers. And you go a little further down on the northeast side, and you, call, you have the Omaha Band. The Omaha Band is over here. And over here on the bottom, very west over here are the Hairy Band, where they call them the Hairy Rope hair rope people. Mm -hmm. And over here on this side, the southwest side, you have the Sutta people, where you have the scabby band. The scabby band. And over here on the northeast side, or uh, southeast side, you have the burnt aorta, which is uh, which is the, our, our principal keeper, our arrow keeper, burnt aorta. Now all these bands over here, they all have a signif significant reason for their names. For their names over here, these uh, these uh, Omissi or the Northern Cheyennes over here were intermarried with uh, with uh, with uh, with Anglo's and with uh, other tribes. So along with the Omissi and Ben over here are also strangers. That's where the strangers camp over here on this side. Mm -hmm. Strangers and the Northern Cheyennes, and over here a little further this way are the uh, grasshoppers. That's uh, Southern Cheyennes who are married to the Northern Cheyennes, intermarried. And down here you have the Omaha people over here who are also intermarried. And over here on the bottom back here are the people, the Harry Band people, or the, they're the main people in the ceremony, the main, the main people in the middle here. And over here you have the, uh, you have the uh, Sittat, Sittat people, Northern, Northern people, or the Scabby Band. And the Scabby Band people is a is, is a layer layer of history that we only got to the few layers that we haven't we haven't yet found them you know got further down to know them. I mean, but these hair these Scabby people are in Watonga, Oklahoma. These Grasshopper people over here and the Omaha people are in Sealing, Oklahoma. Over here on this side, the Burnt Aorta over here, they're in Lawndale, Oklahoma. So all these people are in different towns in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. They're all still in existence today, and it travels all the way back here. It travels all the way back here. It's a giant, giant circle, giant circle of people. And all these, all these are still in existence today, and it's still practiced. And it's, there's no other, no other force that can diminish it. So, you know, this is on this side of Sand Creek. We're still here. We still exist. We still have our ways. We lost a lot. We lost a lot of history. We lost most of the Sand Hill people. We, most, we lost most of the rich men. We lost most of the uh, uh, big lodges. We lost most of the desert people. We, those, were, those are people that, that were very important to our ceremonies. Because a lot of times in our main ceremonies, the crier goes out and he calls all these people. He calls them. He calls the Sand Hill people. He calls the Ridge Men. He calls the the um, Desert people, and he calls the um, Big Lodges. Big Lodges were mostly Rappos and Cheyennes. Uh, Sand Hill people like was a uh, was a uh, uh, white antelope. Sand Hill people, they're they're uh, they're Southern Cheyennes. And uh, desert people were intermarried with the um, Prairie Band Apache, Prairie, Prairie Apaches. So they invite all these people to come and eat, come and participate, come and watch. That, is, that includes all their descendants. All their descendants. If, if these guys are descendant and they have white, white people and their descendants are invited over here. If these people on, at, at the Omaha Society, if they have all these other tribes involved, they're invited. They're invited. So during our ceremonies around these lodges, when we bring people from Santa Carlos Apache, they say, what's those Apaches doing over here? What's those Apaches doing? We caught them. We caught them. When the crier went out and caught this desert people, we caught them. We caught them. These big lodge people, the northern people, 
over there, all the way to, all the way over there to uh, Seattle. Some of those coastal Indians, we caught them. We caught them. So nobody can say around our lodge or we're, why are these people here? They're not supposed to be here. Who are you relatives? Who are you here with? They're really not supposed to say that because we caught them. We caught them to come and eat and come and participate and come and watch. So, you know, that's what, that's what this, uh, this circle is all about. This is what these facets are all about. And everyone has their place around the circle. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about with the painting? I mean, it's, the, de the details are just amazing. I mean, all of, all of your work is always so detailed. Well, you know, I look at these, um, I look at these master Western artists like Frederick Remington, and some of these artists who who done a lot of these paintings, such great detail and accuracy. Mm -hmm. And then I look at some of our Indian artists who who never touched on none of that, who never touched on it, who never touched on. It. In fact, when they did touch on it, they say, "Well, he's not Indian artist. He's not Indian artist." They put us in, they label us and put us in different categories. Whereas I wanted to break out of those categories. I wanted to make things, paint things uh, the way they really actually were. I wanted to show people that that uh, we can actually make things authentic. We can make things, we can put ourselves back in our own environments. This is our environment right here. To me, when they put those uh, paintings of these Indians with a black, no background, no background, just, just, a negative background. They're putting those people out of their environment. They're getting them used to being having nothing. You have no more land. You're on this back background like that. So me myself, I want to put us back in our environment. I wanted to show the people where we came from, and that you know that we appreciated this land and we took care of it. We took care of this land. We only took what we needed. We never, we never uh, took any more than we we could what we could waste. We only took what we needed. We took care of it. We took very good care of this land and it took care of us too. Mm -hmm. So that's what I really like to uh, like to point out to people whenever I'm painting pictures. I want to put us back in our environment. I want to show people where we came from. Anything else you wanted to talk about with this or anything else while we have you here? Well, I think that's uh, I think that's I've talked, touched on the main, the most important um, items and the most important uh, topics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, and I'm I'm this this will be wonderful to have this on on loan to the Denver Art Museum for the exhibit, and when you come back after you've done the lectures and talked to everyone else there, we'll have to talk to you again to hear a little bit more about what happened there. Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh -huh. thank well, thank you. you so much.